Hello folks, today I'm going to talk about tipping bucket rain gauges and how you can integrate one of these with an Arduino. Before I show you the circuit, let's briefly discuss how these gauges work. If you already know how these work, feel free to advance through the next few slides. If you open up this gauge, what you'll find are two buckets of a known volume that are resting on a pivot point. When it rains, the rain collector will start to divert water to one of the buckets. As the bucket fills, the bucket assembly will eventually pivot and dump the rainwater out the bottom of the rain gauge. In the case of the gauge that I'll be demonstrating here, one tip of the bucket assembly is equal to one one hundredth of an inch. Eventually, the other half of the bucket assembly will fill with rainwater, and the process will repeat. In this case, I've had two tips of the bucket assembly, which is equal to two one hundredths of an inch. This is a photo of the old analog equipment used to record tips generated by these buckets. But with the advent of inexpensive microcontrollers, you can now create a digital version of this analog logger. Now that we understand the hardware, you can see that all we really need to do with our Arduino is count the number of tips in order to gauge the depth of rainfall associated with an event. In order to do this, let's remove the rain collector assembly and take a closer look at what's inside the gauge. Here you can see the tipping bucket assembly, and attached to that assembly is a small magnet. So when that assembly pivots, it runs right next to this reed switch. And that, in turn, is something that we can hook up to our Arduino and monitor when the reed switch is activated by the magnet moving next to it. So here's a schematic of our hardware. Essentially what we have is just a switch that opens and closes when the bucket assembly pivots. The reed switch in our gauge is acting just like a regular old toggle switch. In fact, we can demonstrate this by hooking up a toggle switch to a multimeter and then monitoring continuity while we toggle that switch on and off. We can then compare that to what happens when we pivot the bucket assembly on our tipping bucket gauge hooked up to the same multimeter. So again, coming back to our simple schematic, all we're doing is replacing the switch in the schematic with a tipping bucket reed switch. And this is a close-up of what that reed switch looks like. You can see that uh, by default it's open. We put a magnet nearby, uh, the switch closes, and that allows for continuity to be established through our circuit. So in order to demonstrate this action, what I'm going to do is put my mic inside the gauge and then I'm going to slowly move that bucket assembly left and right. And as that magnet comes into proximity of the reed switch, if you listen very closely, you might be able to hear that reed switch uh, closing. And then as the magnet moves away from the reed switch, uh, the reed switch will open uh, to its normally open state. Next, let's hook up our gauge to our multimeter in continuity mode and do the same experiment, only this time listen for continuity as I'm pivoting the bucket. We now understand that there's a reed switch that's closed when it's exposed to a magnet or when the bucket assembly pivots. The state of the circuit can be evaluated by an input pin on our Arduino. Uh, in my case, since I'm using an Adafruit Pro Trinket, the only interrupt pin available for monitoring this is pin 3. When the switch is open, there's no connection with the 5 volt power supply in the circuit. This results in pin 3 reading low, 
Note that you do need to pull this pin low by placing a 10K resistor between it and ground. This prevents the pin from floating, thus avoiding garbage data being read by the Arduino. When the switch is closed, our 5 volt power supply makes a connection with ground. This will result in pin 3 reading high. If we hooked up pin 3 to an oscilloscope, this is what we would expect to see over time. In reality, mechanical switches like reed switches and buttons or toggle switches actually create a little bit of noise or bounce in the signal that's uh, generated when the circuit is closed. Uh, we don't perceive this as humans because we're too slow, but microcontrollers can pick it up, which can certainly cause some problems. As such, we need a way to filter out this noise. In software, we can filter out that noise by setting a debounce constant uh, to basically delay registration of, of what pin 3 is monitoring when there's a change so that that noise is filtered out. So here's the code I'll demonstrate. Parts of this were borrowed from a library developed for a commercial weather station. In this code, I've defined pin 3 as rain pin. This pin can be used as an interrupt on Adafruit's Pro Trinket. I've also set a debounce constant to 80 milliseconds. I'll refer to this constant in my interrupt function when I won't increment my tip counter until this debounce time has elapsed. This should filter out any false call to my interrupt function from a noisy switch. Finally, I've created a variable for storing the number of tips registered by my gauge and set it to zero before my setup and loop blocks run. Here's my interrupt function, which is monitoring my interrupt pin, which I call rain pin. When this pin goes high, it's going to call the counting rain function shown as an argument here. My loop will report the value of my rain trigger variable once a second, but if my interrupt pin is triggered, then I'll call the counting rain function and increment my rain trigger variable by one only if the time for my debounce constant has been exceeded. Let's do a demonstration of this sketch. Not knowing what the problem was, I initially experimented with different debounce times in order to try to calibrate to a constant that would work, but I later found out that this was not a stable solution when executing the code for a long period of time. So what's going on? Well, the intern I was working with in my agency noted that when using timer delays with interrupt service requests, odd things can happen. The bottom line is the interrupt should be used to do very simple things that can happen very quickly and generally should not be used with timers that take more than a microsecond to execute. If you introduce complicated code in a function called by an interrupt or use delays that take more than a couple microseconds, you can introduce all kinds of weird side effects, particularly as it relates to incrementing variables based on timer constants. Considering that my code was working with delays within an interrupt service function and uh, using a constant that uh, was referring to 80 microseconds versus a couple microseconds, it explains why my counter may have been working oddly. So what do I do now? This is the circuit that Jeremy presents, and I've included a photo of an oscilloscope to help me track what's going on when the circuit is powered up. I should mention that this oscilloscope shot is just a kind of a conceptual drawing of, of me tracing the, uh, the actions that are taking place in the circuit. I don't actually have an oscilloscope to make this work. Here you'll notice I've introduced a capacitor and a Schmidt trigger, both of which are helping to smooth the output while also creating a hardware delay. The time of the delay will be determined by the value of the capacitor and circuit resistance known as an RC circuit. Let's start with the circuit having an open switch similar to the state of the gauge when water is filling one of the buckets. 
With the switch open, our capacitor will start to charge. This will result in a high signal coming off the capacitor, which is inverted to low as measured by pin 3 when the signal passes through the Schmidt trigger. Now when the switch is closed, we have a path to ground. As such, the capacitor will slowly start to discharge. When the capacitor is fully discharged, the signal coming off the capacitor will be low, but this will be translated to high by the Schmidt trigger, resulting in a rising signal on the oscilloscope. The delay for that rising signal will be a function of the product of the rating of the capacitor and circuit resistance, also known as the RC time constant. Setting both to a product that will get you through the noise of the switch will help you filter out the noise from being detected by your interrupt pin, resulting in only one rising event and thus only one call to the interrupt function responsible for incrementing your tip counting variable. When the switch is open, the capacitor will begin charging again. The logic of the circuit will be reversed and the signal will be falling. Well, that kind of makes sense schematically, but uh, I'd really like to know what this looks like when it's uh, wired up to a breadboard with a pro trinket. So let's do that next. This shows how we would wire this circuit to an Adafruit Pro Trinket using a capacitor, a Schmidt trigger, and two resistors. Notice that we're going to be measuring uh, the uh, signal coming off the capacitor um, through the Schmidt trigger as shown uh, by the connection that's taking place through the uh, yellow wire which is going through the Schmidt trigger to pin 3 on the Pro Trinket. When the power is on and the switch is open, the capacitor charges and produces a high signal, which is reversed as low when it passes through the Schmidt trigger to pin 3. Now when the power is on and the switch is closed, I provide a means for the capacitor to discharge through the circuit. The delay for the discharge will again be proportional to a product of the rating for the capacitor and the resistance of the circuit, giving me a means to set my debounce time through hardware rather than software. When the capacitor goes low, the resulting signal detected by pin 3 through the Schmidt trigger will be high. This will trigger my interrupt function, which will increment my tipping counter. Note how much we managed to simplify our code by using a hardware interrupt. We now have no need to call all those delays since the debounce constant is essentially built into the hardware. As such, we've eliminated all the issues in using timers in our interrupt service function. And here's a screenshot of my test trying different frequencies to see if I can break the counter. The results were good based on my counting during the test, demonstrating to me that the circuit is fairly robust. Now the tipping bucket gauge that I used in this demonstration is available commercially, but it's also fairly expensive. Um, I was lucky that I was able to borrow one from work. Uh, having said that, you can find these at much lower cost on sites like AliExpress. Or if you're feeling up to it, uh, you can find instructables online that show you how to build these gauges from scratch. In an upcoming chapter, I'll explain how you can integrate these uh, tipping bucket rain gauges uh, with the remote environmental monitor um, that's presented in a prior chapter of this playlist. Thanks for watching, subscribe for updates, and we'll see you next time.